I'm Nadia Vatsalidis, VP of People at Remote. I get to work with amazing people in 75 countries in the world, all distributed. And remote, um, Remote's vision is really to ensure that any company and any person can ultimately connect and um, can, can work. There are, Yoke always says this so nicely, there are great, amazing talent everywhere, but there's not opportunities everywhere. And so remote is the enabler. We are ultimately um, an employment platform. We are an employment employer record. So we make it very easy to hire people in very difficult countries. And so if you ever look for an EOR, please check us out, um, an amazing company um, with a very much technology and product first mindset. Um, Rob, nice to see you in the audience. I know Rob, uh, we engage quite a bit. Um, so I'll start by saying 95% of all the companies that we've seen in the pandemic across the entire world, so not just here in South Africa or just in Germany, really went into this very forced mode and nearly rigid mode. And that was simply not the way people work, right? So having back-to-back -back Zoom calls, constantly having to make decisions in a meeting, and nearly having this sort of forced meeting approach didn't work for many people. And I think it created a really bad and negative experience in the world of remote work. And it's not the way, you know, remote first companies work. And any company in the world can adapt this method. You certainly don't need to even be hybrid to adapt some of the methods I'm sharing today. So full disclosure, I'm very open-minded. I probably myself won't drive to an office every day for many reasons mostly lifestyle orientated, but I'm very open to the fact that that is part of the future. I think hybrid will become um, a huge part of work in the, in the future as well. And so using remote first practices will help solve some of the challenges that people face. Um, imagine having a team that, um, that never has to memorize anything. And so that's really what I'm gonna be talking about today. Imagine ensuring that everyone is set up for success and that's completely self-enabled, regardless of where or how they work and in what time zone they're in. Um, and I think that's the, that's the part that really needs to stand out um, into, in today's call. So if you can go to the second slide, um, we can actually move um, straight on to the third slide, which I want to really dive deep into, which is our five pillars of remote first work. I selected these five today. Um, I can probably talk about 20, but we have an hour and I can deep dive into any of these you know, five topics and that will also take an hour each. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna focus on these five pillars and briefly share why I think each of these pillars work so well in remote first practices. Um, basically in the world of work, a lot of meaningful things need to happen in order for, for people to succeed. And so without belonging, right, and without creating a strategy in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, none of these five pillars will work. So if you think about the world of work and you think about hybrid and in office, there's a lot of things that have to happen in the background in terms of culture to make these five pillars work. So full disclosure, these are the tactical things that I'm going to talk about, but there's many other things around the world of work that you should absolutely consider um, when you when you think about remote first practices, I I first remember joining GitLab back in 2015, and so sharing a bit of of a story of my background. I remember joining and having this tremendous sense of what have I gotten myself into, and how the hell am I going to do this job? Prior to GitLab, I ran a very small company here in South Africa. I had my own executive search firm. I did a lot of HR and people type consulting. I had one American client and a few other international clients, but I knew nothing about the world of tech startup, San Francisco Valley startup and distributed workforce and, and having people in multiple countries. I also had no idea what hyper growth meant at that point. And I think, yes, the handbook intrigued me, but the enablement that happened just in my onboarding experience was literally mind blowing. It literally changed my entire life in the first week of stepping into a company like GitLab. And I really aspire to do that at companies like Remote, but I think more and more companies need to realize what you do in that first week of, of work is gonna change and, and have an impact on everyone. And it all starts with documentation. Um, and so 
Ah, my 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 fourth slide. I'm so sorry, Mark. Now I have to order you around. But if we go to my my fourth slide, I'm going to deep dive into documentation and why does it matter? You know, so much in the in the world of work. Well, whether you are hiring amazing people, whether you are onboarding someone, and whether you have very complicated ways of doing your work. So whether you're an engineer or have an engineering team. Um, and need to share, you know, how you develop something and write all that information down, or whether you just want to know how to relocate someone, right? Docu it all starts with documentation. It all starts with writing something down. And it matters the most in the world of remote work. Um, something else that I've learned from software engineers is, and this is something they've been doing for years and years and years, is they always want to share as much context as possible with each other when they build amazing products, when they ship something in an amazing way, when they go through, you know, a quality check in their engineering pipeline. And we as non-engineers can learn so incredibly much from that. And I think that's where documentation really comes from. It was like, how do I share what, how I built this to make sure someone else can add features or change it in future if it's not written down. And so I, I think it's important to realize for me, this really comes from the world of engineering and the amount of creativity that comes from that space. I think in the world of people, we can all learn a ton from that, um, but bringing the human aspect into it, simplicity probably matters as much as documentation. So um, I, I had a, an amazing call with a company recently and they said to me, well, where should we start? Are you telling us we have to now spend the next three months just writing everything down that we're doing and then continue, you know, with our normal day jobs? No, I, I would start as simply as saying, what am I working on today? Right, I'm handing a relocation of someone that's relocating from the Netherlands to Portugal. Let me write down how I'm doing it and start front loading your documentation like that by getting into the habit of just writing things down. And um, a great way to start anywhere is probably with the onboarding journey. So asking your last hire, if you don't have an onboarding process written down, hey, what happened during your onboarding? Can you write down what was missing? Can you give me feedback? Can you tell me what you needed? And literally live in a call, start documenting that with that person and, uh, and eventually asynchronously building that out. Um, what I've discovered with good documentation, if you do it in the moment, it takes five seconds. If you want to do it later, it takes five hours. Um, and so I'll really start by just simply saying, lean into whatever you use for documentation, whether that's Notion, whether that is, there's so many great apps, whether it's GitLab, if you have a more sort of engineering friendly or technical team, um, or whether it's a completely different repository space um, to or a wiki, just start and start creating something. Um, if you can make it open source, you'll score like 20 points from me. Um, I love the, the world of documentation in open source because it also brings this amazing attraction to people externally that then learn with you as you continue to scale. Obviously, there's sensitive things that you can't open source. Um, but remote, actually, the public handbook, I, I always ask the team the question, can you make it public? So whatever they worked on, relocations, benefits, um, how we approve an expense, how to submit something, whatever they work on, I always ask them, is, can this be made publicly? Can we share it with the world? And it's amazing how our handbook has evolved in the last two years and how many things have been become publicly available. And that also enables other people to start up, other freelancers to start creating opportunities. It doesn't create competitors. It really creates peers and amazing peers in a tiny tech industry. Um, that is literally continuously trying to take over the world of work. Um, I currently work in a people team of roughly 28 people. This team is distributed in between seven and 10 different countries. A few, people, a few folks move around and travel quite a bit. And the time zones are incredible. I mean, it's super vast. We haven't selected one time zone whatsoever for the team, so we hire everywhere. And it's just incredible to see how this team works asynchronously. In fact, our weekly meeting for the people team is actually mostly spent on social engagement and way less on solving problems. 
And so we really have tested this process in terms of documentation over and over again. And it's just been incredible to see how the accessibility it's created in this team, the succession, and the amount of knowledge sharing that's happened across 28 people um, in the last uh, two years and, and during our sort of mass growing and hyper growing years. Um, my second pillar was asynchronous communication. And so you don't, if, if you work in any environment, asynchronous communication can create the efficiency that you've never experienced before. The amount of time that you save by making asynchronous decisions, first of all, is game changing. In many ways, this is actually part of a people first model because asynchronous work does reduce so many things, but it also creates very meaningful ways to solve usually very complex problems. So I think my, my number one, you know, um, my, my number one question is from everyone, all my peers in the industry, people are switching to remote work, people that are in office switching to remote first and asynchronous practices is, well, how do I switch? And I think I've selected a few things, but there's a ton more. I think just removing the aspect of always solving a problem in a meeting and stopping yourself from saying, can we hop on a five minute call to solve this big finance issue or this minor people problem? Um, and rather do it asynchronously in communication makes a tremendous difference to speed. Um, and it actually gives everyone time to start becoming problem solvers. In the world of work in 2023, you need folks to continuously learn how to self-enable and how to solve problems by themselves. If you keep hopping onto calls with people to try and solve problems with them, you are telling them how to do that and you're not creating growth mindsets in your teams. Um, and you yourself are going to rely so heavily on that conversation that it's going to be very, very difficult to let go and trust someone to stop making decisions and solving problems with you asynchronously or by themselves. And so there, there is so many things you can do. The, the second thing is always remove the expectation of answering instantly. <laughs> Instant messenger apps has taken the world over by always being 24 seven online. Depends what job you're doing, but if you're not on call in an ER medical team, I don't think it's necessary to respond instantly at 10 p.m. to anything, unless that is the hours you choose to work and that's okay too. And so we've removed at remote, at GitLab, at other aspirational companies like Zapier, et cetera. We all have removed the expectation to instantly respond. The other thing this has done is way more meaningful responses. It nearly helps you to read something twice before you hop onto this problem-solving, quick-fixing type of mode and go, oh, wait a minute, what they're actually asking is X, and I've documented it, so let me go grab the link and not answer them in Slack. So part of this removing this expectation has made people go, let me find the documentation for this, and if I don't have it, let me write it down and share the link with them. And that creates an environment where folks can truly feel less anxious, less stressed, constantly have this like, I have to be online and hustling mode into meaningful conversations, meaningful problems being solved, and actually solving the cause of the problem, especially when it comes to customers, maybe, um, and, and remove the quick fixing, I just need to solve this thing in five seconds type of vibe, which doesn't work and doesn't last. Um, I love removing last minute meetings. Last minute meetings does create a fire drill mindset. And fire drill mindsets and, and last minute meetings should be preserved for true urgency. Meaning your entire customer website is down. You're unable, uh, your customer is unable to make a payment and payments happen every, every two seconds, right? Last minute meetings are, are truly for where there's a huge infrastructure issue and you simply cannot make something happen that is definitely costing you money. Um, but doing last minute meetings every day, for example, hey, John, can we hop on a call quickly? Like, I, I would highly recommend just stop doing that. Do it for when you really, really need to, but instead hop to async and go, I've created a, a two-minute Loom video for you on why I disagree on this topic. 
watch it and let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it or why I agree with your topic or why I think we should iterate on this. And so there's other asynchronous ways that you can absolutely solve those problems. Um, I like canceling meetings without an agenda. My team can attest to this because they've probably all received a canceled meeting at some point where there were no agenda items, especially group meetings. If there's no agenda on the, you know, for a specific call or no items on the agenda 24 hours before the call, I cannot imagine there's anything important enough to discuss um, in a sync meeting. And so I have this golden rule that if you want to connect with me and there's nothing added, I'm probably going to cancel. I don't do this for one-on-ones. One-on-ones is sacred time with your team, but I do check. So when I see there's no agenda items, I check back and say, I can imagine there's a lot going on. I'd love to connect and catch up and see how Luna, your pup is doing, or you know how your weekend was, or did you go on that hike that you mentioned and really connect socially but is there other things going on that you would rather do this later? Um, or have you just not had a chance to add agenda items? And I usually do it 24 hours before the actual call. I do this in bulk. So I look at my days ahead and I just send a bunch of messages to folks um, to remind them to add items. And the response is usually like, I'm slammed. I have a lot going on. I'll, I'll share photos of what happened this weekend on Slack and I'm gonna share it with the whole team but I really have no need to connect. Or yes, I'm adding items now. And so it's a great nudge. Get into the habit of doing it and it becomes completely organic for everyone, even if you are meeting in the office. So do it on a Monday. If you're going to go into meeting rooms and those meeting rooms have to be booked, double check if you actually want to be sitting in a boardroom for an hour or 25 minutes on a topic and whether that topic really needs to be discussed or if it hasn't been able to be solved already. Um, I like normalizing work blocks. This actually works really well in an office environment where people get interrupted all the time. And get folks to make fun stickers or even better, print some swag that said work block and make them stick it somewhere so someone can see I'm in the zone. I am not going to engage right now for a chit chat because I have things that I must get done today. And if I engage in this amazing chit chat, it does mean I'm including all the folks that's working hybrid in this fun conversation. So why don't we make time for that? Why don't we have space for socialization and create accessibility for everyone? And so think about how you can adapt this work blocks in an in a office environment. I know meeting rooms exist, but they are always busy. I sometimes go to a co-working space close to my house and I always find the little booth that I'm supposed to take calls in it's always booked by so many other people and I simply cannot be in there. And that also means it's very difficult for me to have a meeting that day. Um, and then I tend to cancel it. So think about how you can create space for people to have deep work time. Um, whether it means when they're, where their headphones are on, they're focusing. And when it's off, they're not focusing. You put stickers on that, fun swag idea. Um, or whether they can put it on their desk, like a little sign to say, this is my focus time. I'm sorry, I'm not engaging, but I need to get this done. Or if they have an office closed the door uh, with a fun sticker, on, fun sticker on as well. You don't want to block people from engaging, but you must remember human beings need space and time to be creative. And if they always have to rush from meeting to meeting and call to call, they simply do not have enough brain space to get meaningful work done. So normalizing the fact that you can put calendar blocks in your calendar does become a very meaningful way for people. And it's such a simple way um, to implement that. Our calendars at Remote, in fact, is available to everyone. So even at executive level, everyone can see our calendars. And so what's really nice, if you're an executive or you're a manager of people, if your calendar reflects work blocks, it's much, it feels much safer and trusting to do that for other people that are potentially more sort of early stage um, in their career. So just a nudge there uh, if you're an executive and why you should do it. Um, and if you have a problem currently, try and solve it async. Try and do it today, tomorrow, um, and see how it goes. And let me know, like DM me on LinkedIn or send a LinkedIn public message and, and let me know how that goes. The next topic, which is often not discussed enough in the world of remote first and asynchronous work, um, whether in office hybrid, you know, or remote first and distributed, um, is processes and tools. But 
the biggest part of that is accessibility. I'm not talking about whether someone has access to log into a tool. I'm talking about the equal opportunity of access to the tools and processes that you have. If, if you don't provide accessibility for someone to access an in-person meeting, that is not an equal opportunity and it's against inclusion. It's exclusive. And so I'll start by, say, by saying, and, and later on in my talk, I'll talk a little bit about top-down methods. And I actually find accessibility is one of those things where if it's not included from a top-down way, people simply overlook it and they start creating very exclusive ways of work instead of thinking about how can I include the three people that's working from three countries with my team that's here in my amazing office in London or New York City. And so accessibility is often overlooked. Um, I'm very passionate about accessibility in the world of inclusion, but it also comes to accessibility of social engagement. Um, you have a water cooler in that fancy New York or German office or here in Joburg. Um, remember that person working remotely or the individual that chose that day not to come to the office cannot access that fun conversation that's going on. It's okay that the conversation is going on, but make extra space and times, make extra tools available for folks then to socially connect anyway, and make sure that they have that they have access to the time to do so. We have these blocks in our calendars company-wide. It's on our company calendar that blocks everyone's calendars on social time. This has actually evolved so much and it became so organic where people has now used it for a group coffee chat or a pets discussion or a remote culture connection around you know, a specific inclusion topic. Um, we call it culture connections in the world of work. It's usually uh, ERGs. And these ERG sessions are built around neurodiversity. It's built around diverse diversity in the workplace, women in the workplace, et cetera, right? So I love how these social connection time in calendars have taken these group formats where people started doing what they wanted during that time with a group of colleagues, and they keep adapting it to different, different social engagements. And um, there's also story time that you can use during this time where every week someone else comes to share a story about their week. Story time can bring so much inspiration um, to teams. So there's an idea as well to create that level of both the tool, whether that's in Zoom, Slack, you can have a Slack group conversation now and a Slack hangout type of vibe or a, or a um, Meet, a Google Meet call. And unless you have an amazing app for it, do that as well. But um, make this, the tool available and the space and accessibility and calendars available for people to connect. Does all your employees have the right tools to do their job? Or are you expecting them, expecting them to sort of, you know, rely on themselves? In the world of work, um, we've talked a lot about inclusion and a lot about the cultural aspect. I actually find the world of remote work and remote first work has included so many people from demographics that's been very difficult to find great opportunities in tech and aspirational startups and growing companies and even in the freelancer space. Folks with disabilities, folks from the neurodiverse aspect have now gained amazing opportunities. And so making sure people can access additional tools is necessary. And that's where um, accessibility comes in a different form, where you sometimes need to individualize the experience for someone. So again, start asking yourself, does the three people on my team have all the tools do they need? Is there something specific this one person needs? Am I creating exclusivity for them? Meaning, am I typing in a color that they cannot read because they're colorblind and black and white is best for that. And so I think it's about reaching a little bit deeper than just the tactical aspect of, yes, they have access to email and we've given them a computer or we've given them a budget to buy a laptop. There's more to the world of tools and, and processes, which is why I keep mentioning um, accessibility on this track. I, um, I will also say, oh, one back before we get to flexibility, sorry, nearly there. Um, I'll just also add that um, 
you really want to remove com complexity from your tools um, and, and processes. And so start also thinking about the simpli simplification thereof, meaning writing down what people can purchase and why. And so also creating accessibility via that. And um, looking at the time, Mark, should we hop straight to uh, flexibility? Yes? Cool. And so this is probably my favorite topic. I, you know, remote did this amazing survey with 10,000 full-time employees, so not freelancers, need to call that out, in France, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, and the US. And we did it across different genders, different levels, different industries, different job roles, and different parental statuses in different, you know, different countries. I've, I've mentioned the countries. And interestingly enough, and I did link it in my slide deck, but I'll link it in the chat and maybe someone can put it in the chat so that everyone can see um, as well, um, if you want to go look at the survey. But basically, flexibility was the number one benefit that people are after. I clearly remember how a few years ago it was healthcare for many countries and actual benefits were really important. Now it's more the perk of flexibility that matters. And it's incredible to see how this change has happened the last three years. And it's definitely happened the last three years and not prior. And so if I talk about flexibility, I always talk about if you start treating people like adults, a lot of great things happen in your company. And the amount of ownership people have and take, the amount of belonging and sense of belonging and trust it creates is part of creating that shared success and that shared ownership and success. And so the more flexibility you can create through things like flexible hours, if it's not a remote company, or the flexibility of coming in and out of the office on the days you choose, by also being an adult and knowing you have a team meeting every Thursday, right? Flexible benefits, for example, offering different um, um, offer packages to new hires. I recently saw a LinkedIn post, which I loved, where a company was posting three different job offers. One was a high salary with low stock options. One, so maybe a rate, if it's a freelancer, a high hourly rate. And if, I don't know if stock options is part of the world of freelancing, but it could be. Um, and the other one was lower compensation, higher stock. And the third one was average compensation, average stock plus benefits, which included the health healthcare sort of track. And it's amazing when they started seeing what people accepted and how they created that individual opportunity. They're putting the flexibility into the individual's hands to decide in their life stage what offer they wanted to accept. So great benefit uh, in the world of work. Flexibility to take time off when you really, really need it. Flexibility around work in terms of where you do it, when you do it, how you do it, um, truly, truly matters. As long as it aligns with the company's vision, the efficiency and productivity that you require for them to work at, um, and the success and the goals that's being met during that time. And then flexibility um, around um, all these, all these aspects, so the travel, the nomad aspect, freelancers have this unique opportunity to travel a lot more than someone in full-time employment. So I'll plug that a little bit. Having the opportunity to go and work for Spain two months, or like Mark in the Canary Islands right now. And um, lastly, I'll go over to my last slide, which is around decision-making. I have discovered through my time um, at Girla, but also at Remote, that the biggest factors of failure is when decisions are always top down and it's not shared why and how it was made and it's simply like we are doing this and you have to accept it and that's what we're doing you know and goodbye I, I find that it also is a creator of toxicity people love being part of the idea they they love being part of the decision if you're planning to implement a benefit this year before you do, ask people, what benefit do you want? Do a survey, run a, a, a survey that will take you 10 minutes to create in, you know, in Google Forms, um, if that's what you have access to. And literally say, do you want healthcare? Or would you consider A, B, or C? And ask them what they want. And all of a sudden, you're including the whole company or the whole team 
into that decision before you say, oh, we've implemented benefits and it's so great and everyone's going to love it. I've learned a lot from asking people what is it that you want in a very inclusive way and designing the entire experience around people's need, needs. What I've also discovered and a great way to help others to include in decisions is if you have an onboarding process, make sure the feedback you're getting on your onboarding, if you're asking at the end of an onboarding journey, give us feedback, make sure you use that feedback to evolve your onboarding journey because then your onboarding journey is created by the people of your company. And all of a sudden, they have made the decision around how your onboarding should work. There will always be ideas that you absolutely cannot implement and that potentially completely random. But there are sometimes the most incredible and most creative ways to design this experience around your company and how you want to create it.